Hi, we are having a conversation with Dr. Dwight Lee. He is a Chair of Global Markets and Freedom at the Southern Methodist University. Uh, Dr. Lee, when one thinks about censorship, one thinks about eliminating freedom of the press or of thinking, but one does not think about prices. What does censorship have to do with prices? Well, it's interesting you bring that up because you know most people do think of censorship, government censorship, telling the press what they can print, telling people what they can say, you know, denying freedom of speech. But the most effective way we communicate, people communicate with each other, and not just with the people they're talking to or they're reading their material, but around the world, is through prices. And governments, when they restrict markets, either by you know, putting up tariffs, by regulating businesses in ways that prevent businesses from responding to consumers, by price controls, you, you name it. There's a whole host of ways. Central planning is a form of censorship because they, they prevent markets from working and they substitute political information for the information that's communicated through markets. And those market prices are amazingly effective at you know, transmitting information. Let me give you an example. Let's assume the people in Iceland want to eat more bananas. Well, they have to communicate somehow to millions, hundreds of millions around the world that they want to eat more bananas and they want to eat them right now. And that means that other people around the world have to eat fewer bananas, right? Because they can't grow bananas, more bananas just immediately. So how do they do that? Well, a lot of people think, well, we got all this information technology. This is the information age. You know, that means iPods and that means cell phones and that means emails and that means all this stuff that allows us to communicate. Well, prices are much better than those things. You know, this is not the information age, a new thing. We've had the information age ever since they started trading with each other. If those people in Iceland wanted to communicate to banana eaters around the world, you think they're going to call them on their cell phones, their iPhones? You know, there's too many people. They'd be calling people that don't even eat bananas. You know, it's wrong number. You don't eat bananas. I don't want to talk to you. I want to talk to somebody that eats bananas. That wouldn't work at all. You know, what they do is they buy more bananas. They, they bid the price of bananas up. And that price goes all around the world. And people all around the world see that higher price. And that tells them to eat fewer bananas. And they do it. It not only tells them they should eat fewer bananas, it motivates them to do it. And as a result, you know, people in Iceland get more bananas. They get more bananas. And, uh, you know, they couldn't possibly communicate that information with cell phones or emails. And not only that, even if they could call everybody up, even if they could call everybody up, you'd have a situation where people wouldn't be motivated to use the information. And even if they were motivated to use the, informa the information, they wouldn't know how many bananas not to eat. You know, yeah, how, how do I know? I want to eat fewer bananas because I really care about these people in Iceland. But do I, do I eat one banana less a week or two bananas less a week? How many? Well, prices tell them that, right? Not really. It doesn't really tell them eat one banana less. But market's clear. And I'll guarantee you what would happen with that higher price. The people around the world outside of Iceland would reduce their consumption of bananas by exactly the amount that the people in Iceland want to increase their consumption of bananas at the new higher price. You know, that is amazing uh, communication. There's no way to do that communication without prices, market prices. And this works for bananas, for credit, for capital, for individuals. Good point, because we're not talking, to, I'm just using bananas as an illustration. There's thousands of products we're doing that for every day around the world. That's how we cooperate with each other. That's how we share with each other. That's how we take others into consideration. That's how the invisible hand works. And if you didn't have that, you'd have, you'd, you wouldn't have, an, no matter how many iPods and cell phones and emails you had, you would live in informational darkness. 
you know, you wouldn't have an information society, no matter how many digital doodads that we had. Now, I'm not saying that, uh, that we don't like these digital technologies, but, but one of the big advantages we get from digital technologies is it makes it easier for to access prices and get the information from prices. That's, uh, you know, we can also do other things, but one of the big advantages of, 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 of the, inter the, the technology that makes up the so-called information age is that it allows us to um, access prices and get price information we otherwise couldn't have gotten. And, and the, the problem I'm talking about here is when government brings in, you know, price controls and uh, they, they import restrictions and they put on, you know, one-size-fits-all, you know, regulations, uh, when they subsidize products, when they tax products differentially, they're just basically censoring that information. They're reducing the information that you and I use to communicate and cooperate with each other. And, and one cannot allocate resources properly if, if one does not have the appropriate information. Or, or if it is censored, which is the same thing. That's right. Basically, government, with a whole host of policies, is censoring the information we need to avoid wasting resources, that we need to take better use of the environment, that we need to cooperate with each other and use our resources efficiently. If people recognize that prices were a way we communicated and recognize that government uh, was censoring that valuable information, you know, they'd be outraged. You know, they're outraged. They would be outraged if the government came in and said the press can only print such and such. You know, we're going to control what the press prints. Well, when government comes in with these restrictions on the market, that's the same thing. That's the government saying well, you can't communicate the way the information you want to communicate. We're going to control that communication. And that's why, and, and that's, and hopefully people would recognize that as, you know, once they recognize the role of prices, and this is just Hayek, you know, Hayek made this argument in his 1945 article on the use, of, on the use of knowledge in society. Uh, once if people recognize that prices were way, ways of communicating and recognize that as censorship, there might be more public outcry at some of these policies that government engages in that destroys information and prevents us from communicating inform information. Uh, that's, why, that's why capitalism works so much better than socialism. Capitalism allows people to communicate with each other. It makes better use of the knowledge we have. Socialism substitutes the knowledge that you and I have about our everyday situation and our preferences and what we can do to help others and what others can do to help us it substitutes that information for the information, the very limited information, of a few bureaucrats, a few politicians. And so what you're doing is you're systematically destroying information and substituting a limited amount of information for a world of information. And no wonder capitalism works so much better than socialism. Well, thank you, Dr. Lee, for sharing these ideas with us. And thank you very much.